Good afternoon. I'm Mike Newshaw. This is a panel discussion about tennis specifically um, and tennis literature and tennis writing, which are two different things. The journalism and the literature of tennis I think of as very distinctive uh, genres. Um, I, I assume you know everybody else on the panel. Louisa Th Thomas, Rohan Ricardo Phillips, Jeff Dyer, who's in everybody's thoughts after last night's <laughs> uh, welcome aboard speech. Um, I'm, did I say who I am? I'm Mike Mushaw. Um, uh, we're going to try to keep this uh, tight and fast moving and um, hitting for the lines go. With, it, with, every, with every remark that we make. Jeff, you start us off. You, you hold serve. Oh, okay, yeah. Well, I thought it might be nice if we, uh, uh, if we talked about uh, um, if there are any particular writers or books on tennis that we hold in, you know, in particular esteem, because uh, it's one of the things, it's very, it's peculiarly difficult to write about tennis for reasons that I mentioned last night. I mean, how do you get around this problem of, you know, cross-court Cross court at 15 love, or that mm -hmm. line that uh, mm -hmm. David Foster Wallace quotes from mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. um, from uh, Tracy Austin. So yeah, I just wondered mm -hmm. if there are exemplary tennis writers other than yourself, Mike, or or uh, my colleagues. Yeah. You know, anyway, they, so uh, that would be uh, that would be my opening. Well, do you have a favorite tennis book yourself? Oh, I see. Well, as it happens, I, I <laughs> do. It wasn't so self-serving. Well, it seems to me that. Um, I mean, I worry that there might be such a great degree of consensus about this that yeah. the uh, conversation could sort of peter out. But it seems to me that David Foster Wallace is the, 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 the best writer about, consistently the best writer about tennis that I've come across. Mm -hmm. Although for me, there is a fundamental incompatibility about Foster Wallace's most famous essay about Roger Federer, mm -hmm. which is this, that uh, one of the things we like about uh, David Foster Wallace is all those w Wallisian ticks, all mm -hmm. those parentheses, the italics, mm -hmm. the vocabulary. And it's always seemed to me that actually, uh, you know, Federer with that lovely balletic grace, Foster Wallace has got much more in common with, you know, Raphael Nadal's endless ticks and always picking his shorts out of his mm. ass, mm -hmm. that kind of uh, mm. thing. Mm. Um, but, uh, but I think one of the, the key things about Foster Wallace is that um, he, um, the, you can, I mean, it's such a basic point, but even if you've got no interest at all in tennis, you cannot but be swept along by mm. uh, the, the brilliance of, of the writing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. That's a classic pick. Um, there are things about um, David Forster Wallace's writing now that I find particularly um, fascinating and different, and it's that he clearly was a writer who lived in a world of standard definition television. So he actually brought up certain things about being there mm. that you couldn't see on standard uh, yeah. definition yeah, television yeah. that you can clearly see now, mm. right? Great point, um, yeah. Uh, and it's funny how kind of like time makes experiences that a writer depicts change. So he is also somebody who was um, giving us something that technology couldn't give us at the time, but mm -hmm. in certain moments now can. Uh, for me, John McPhee's levels of the game um, marked a before and after about what I thought you can do with tennis writing. Um, picturing taking a tennis match starting from the um, rise of the first toss of the serve um, through the match and having this kind of cinematic going in and out between the match and the people's lives. Mm -hmm. um, in immortal figures such as Arthur Ashe and what it meant to see him playing a uh, US Open final, and Carl Grabner, somebody who's kind of been lost to history, um, but uh, is really dipped in amber in that work. Um, so he's a monumental figure for me, and that, that book remains for me a true classic. Um, Louisa, you had some perfect words for that book that I won't share for <laughs> the uh, audience, but they're really perfect. Um, and also, though we're supposed to take our esteemed colleagues out, you know, the three of you have been wonderful, wonderful exemplars of how to do it right. There is a lot of tennis writing, but a lot of it is beat writing. Mm. And if you go to um, post-match, you know, interviews and things like that, you see people doing the grind. That's a different mm. type of writing, um, which I respect, but it's a very leveraged type of writing. Mm -hmm. um, and like the game itself, I'm very interested in uh, the way that you can have a leverage-free experience writing about tennis. 
And the more you dig, the more difficult that becomes. Uh, my book, The Circuit on Tennis, I dedicated to Louisa. Louisa has dimensions to writing um, that are really unparalleled, and uh, I'm a better writer for reading your work, especially. Um, but other than that, I feel like writing about tennis is also kind of paying forward the era that you live in. Um, you know, we're fortunate, as you said, to see the three. I'm not really a hierarchical person in terms of who is the greatest of all time, but mm. Federer, Nadal, Djokovic, it's, it's difficult to mm. top an era like this. And we're very fortunate to, um, to have it. So I'm glad to see that, you know, we're all writing beautiful sentences about it. Um, I would say I would co-sign the writers that have already been mentioned and particularly, you know, levels of the game and David Foster Wallace and um, the circuit actually was hugely um, influential to me, in a, but I'm biased probably. Um, but I think one of the fun and interesting things about tennis is that it can be written about in a lot of different ways. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a genre that to me is almost genreless. And I actually, tennis was the first kind of sports writing that I did. And one of the things that attracted to me, attracted me to it was that um, there was a kind of freedom to it. You know, you didn't need to have um, an antecedent in mind. Like I could summon, try and summon the spirit of David Foster Wallace and some of the kind of like aesthetic, you know, very granular descriptions of points and also the kind of like big ideas and you know frameworks that he tried to put people into but at the same time you could you know draw on mike's you know vast reportage example of doing really kind of like looking at the kind of like you know more like investigative re reporting and like looking at actually like the 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 way that these systems like play out in the real world and you could also do more like essayistic writing. And there was a lot of comedy in tennis. And yeah. there's a lot of um, <laughs> like pathos in tennis. So it sort of seemed to me that this was like something that you could sort of, um, you could sketch, you could go deep, you could report, you could, you could there was like a, a kind of like, there was no template, you could just do it. And that to me was like actually incredibly liberating as a writer and actually really, I think, if, help me become a writer in some ways, that kind of feeling of freedom. So I guess that's a sort of non-answer, <laughs> but. And Mike. Well, thank you. you're the moderator now. You... Uh, no, but uh, we, uh, we'd <laughs> like to hear your thoughts yeah, on uh, just, the great. <clears throat> please stay in your lane. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Is the just, doubles lane just, or singles just, lane? Just What's your lane? <laughs> <clears throat> I don't, uh, you know, I'm on again tomorrow for 55 minutes, if they can hold me to that. And I'll have a lot more to say, but um, I disagree with almost everything that's been said so far. Um, actually, I, I, I loved Levels of the Game, but it's a book that will never be written again um, or anything remotely like it. And it's worth pointing out that several people have tried to emulate what John McPhee did there. And there was there's one very good reason why it won't happen, and that is because the players, no player, would grant an author the right to do that kind of book. Mm -hmm. John Wertheim's uh, you know, book about the famous match at Wimbledon between Federer and Nadal, uh, he, he had in mind to do that, but neither Nadal nor Federer would cooperate. Mm -hmm. You have to understand that Clark Grabner and Arthur Ashe sat down with McPhee uh -huh. in front of a video machine and went point by point with him through that. Nadal and Federer wouldn't spend however long it took for less than a trillion dollars. I mean, you've got to understand that it was just the Davis Cup, new format now, and Roger, who is everybody's favorite human, um, is also an extraordinarily greedy guy. Say what else about him you will, he instead went off on an exhibition tour of South America where he received $2 million a night. Um, uh, that's even more than we're getting for this. Uh, <laughs> and that's my beef. <laughs> that's my beef. No, I, 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 the money in tennis now has, uh, as uh, Mark said, I'm talking about Carl, not Groucho, um, said, you know, a change in 
quantity is a change in quality. And the, the change in the amount of money in tennis just within the time that I've been covering the sport has been so astronomical as to render any sort of judgment um, uh, moot. Uh, you'd, you'd have to take into consideration, just as you do, the, the fact that the players that now play with, with rackets that are made out of sort of space age materials and they were playing with wood when I first started covering tennis, you have to take into consideration that when uh, John McEnroe won Wimbledon for the first time, he received something like $20,000. I mean, now it's $3 million. Um, uh, but John McEnroe didn't need the money, though, either. Pardon? But he didn't need the money, either. He doesn't need the money now. And he but didn't. he didn't need it then, either. He, he went to Trinity. His dad was he, was, he was comfortable, you know? Okay. I think that, you know, hold it. I, I didn't qu completely understand that. He didn't need the money then? Well, I just, I'm just saying that the, the prize money, I don't think that McEnroe was playing for the check, right? Oh, there's where I disagree <laughs> enormously. Everybody always says this. At the end of a big tournament, they all say, well, bud, they're out here paying for $3 million. Not that that's on their mind, because they could give a kid. They want the title. They don't care about the money. I think that's all they think about is the money. And if not, why did Roger go off and play exhibition matches for $2 million when he's already won over $100 million in prize money? It always it comes down to the money. When they say it's not about the money, it's about the money. Um, I, I remember when Mary Jo Fernandez, who if you remember her, she's now a, a commentator, lovely girl, very thin and fragile physically though, and everybody said it would be a good thing if she built herself up in the gym. And I remember talking to her coach, Juan Avendon, you know, and saying, why doesn't she? And he said, well, right up to this tournament in Philadelphia, she's flying to Tokyo for an exhibition match. She's getting $500,000. I said, well, that seems short-sighted on her part when she could be in there doing push-ups. And he, <laughs> he I, I won't try to imitate his accent, but he said, well, what would you do if you, somebody offered you $500,000 to fly? to Tokyo. I said, I'd do it for $5,000, but <laughs> anyway. Um, just before we move on, um, I, rather, I rather like the adversarial panel. So I would take issue with your, what seems your uh, admiration for the John McPhee book, because it seems there's a, a really important misconception at the heart of it. Forgive me if I'm remembering incorrectly, but he seems to say that the way Ash plays is an expression of Ashness, of his mm. personality, and the mm. way that the other guy plays mm. is an expression of, 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 of his, what's his name again? Gravener. Clark, right? Clark Gravener. Yeah. yeah. And it seems to me that's not right. I mean, the way people play tennis is just the way people play tennis, and then you can extrapolate that back. But if you think of, say, Rafael Nadal, you know, this fierce bull who's just so pumped up and ragged. But I think one of the reasons that he does that weird thing of hesitating at the lines, even mm. during the changeover, is because that is specific to him on court. Uh, within about five minutes, it seems to me that he's decompressed and become this rather gentle, nice-ish guy, although I'm certainly conscious of the ferocious determination than mm. it, that he and Roger and everyone else needs to, uh, to get to the top. But I, I just wondered if you wanted to, how, how you felt about that fundamental idea of McPhee's. Louisa. Well, I mean, I think it's a fundamental tenet of a lot of tennis writing, and I'm guilty of this myself sometimes, but reading psychology into a playing style, mm -hmm. you know, that, that it has to mean something, you know, it has to mean something that Roger is so elegant, and so we assume that he's an elegant human being, you know, it, it has to mean something that Serena Williams is so, you know, Serena Williams, you know, and it, that becomes, that becomes shorthand for something, um, and it means something that, um, you know, Djokovic's personality, you know, sort of seems to extend from his style and Murray's kind of like back and forth, you know, angst sort of mm -hmm. stands in for, I mean, in a way, like I completely understand the 
the need to resist that, at the same time, you're actually describing, or I'm describing, some of why I like to watch, you know, because I am watching human beings out there, and I'm watching, you know, types and tropes and, and, and actual human beings, and, and part of the challenge of being a sports writer is um, first negotiating with yourself, you know, what is the experience of watching this, and then how am I going to be honest to the reality of what's going on, you know, because there's a, ga there's a separation there, you know, and so, um, you know, you can do that in different ways. You can, you can report, you know, you can also just like look at yourself, you know. Um, but we all have, you know, different kind of like levels of commitment to the idea of people. I mean, David Foster Wallace, who we've spent a long time praising, is someone who was like very committed to the idea that the athlete like had uh, no personality, <laughs> you know, that there was a kind of, and I don't actually think that's true, you know, to be honest. Like, I'm sure it's not true. Maybe it was true in the case of, Michael Joyce, but the, you can, if you spend like <clears throat> only, you know, a few minutes inside of a tennis tournament, you realize that like actually everybody's, a lot of people are quite different from each other. So where is this, you know, where is this coming from? And, and the thing that we can see, you know, the thing that we can connect to is, are the, the kind of peculiarities. So I, I think you're right, you know, the fact that these Rafael Nadal, I think it probably is a very gentle person. That seems to come across when he speaks, and he seems very vulnerable and seems very aware of his own vulnerability, and that is at odds with his kind of like bull, you know, personality, you know, on court. But at the same time, I also think that when you're watching him, like, you know, five hours into a match and he's sort of doing these like flinging forehands or something, I mean, there's such a kind of like visceral um, sensation that you're watching something like, meaningful, you know, in terms of like who he is. And so uh, it's almost irresistible. And so then the question is like, how, how much credence do you give to it? How much credence do you give to the, the legend and the person and... Well, uh, Jeff, what you're saying, I think is um, something our tennis playing friend Ezra Pound once said that every failure of art is a failure of character. Um, and but I would agree with you. I, I object to that kind of uh, assumption because clearly every failure in tennis is not a failure of character uh -huh. or even an expression of character. It's sometimes as simple as uh, somebody being bigger or faster or more powerful, better eyes, whatever it is. I mean, luckier. Pardon? Uh, luckier. luckier. Yeah. yeah. Luckier. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But after all, that's what, yeah. that's what Napoleon used to say as he appointed generals. He would go down a list and he would get their virtues told to him by his aides, but he would ask at the end of it, but is he lucky? Yeah. And that was right. always the, uh, the uh, mm -hmm. defining question. Um, you got passed over here. No, I didn't get passed over. I was just kind of taking it in and thinking about it. I, I, you know, uh, you're right, with McPhee's writing, it's a question of uh, chicken and egg. McPhee had great access, as, yeah. as you yeah. pointed out, Mike, but I think that after McPhee, we've, in the absence of access, and I think that access is a huge Right. topic about right. tennis, right. Mm -hmm. but in the absence of access, style becomes access. So we right. allegorize yes. players through their style because that's mm -hmm. what we get. Right. Um, the funny thing is we also kind of willfully forget things. Like I love the fact that for as allegorically elegant as Federer is, nobody shanks uh, more balls yeah, than yeah, Federer. Yeah. If you just watch Federer in Wimbledon, you think, oh, but if you watch Federer at Monte Carlo, Indian Wells, or I mean, you're gonna get two or three balls per match that end up in the crowd because he plays really difficult. He toes the baseline with a one-handed backhand. He's gonna miss some stuff. And I, I love that. I love where the kind of allegory or the idea of the self fails. I love that there are three levels to Rafa that we've lived with. We've seen Rafa go from not being able to speak English at all mm, to be able to express himself pretty well. Yes, yeah. But we also understand him as Spanish, but he speaks Mallorquí. So he speaks three languages. So there's not even just the Spanish Rafa, there's another Rafa, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. And so he has this kind of artichoke of a personality. Um, and I love talking to Swiss about Roger Federer. Oh, because please, it becomes a tell us about that. Different... What's the Swiss uh, insight? The, what's the Swiss dope on Roger? 
Well, as Twain said, now I feel like I'm starting a sentence like Mike, um, but I hate all generalizations, especially this one. But you know, people from, for instance, Francophone uh, Switzerland recognize a strangeness and a foreignness, because hello, his mother's South African, from somebody named Roger and not Roger. Like you're always encountering a type of otherness in his Swiss. We see him as so quintessentially Swiss, but he is, an, he is if not an immigrant, he is made up of parts that exist also in his name. He's not Rouget Federer, he's Roger Federer, which is a type of otherness. And I find myself also interested in this connection to Africa. And we think about the humanitarian work he does in Africa, and I wonder if there's a legacy of that also in his connection to his mm. mother, I, right? Um, Michael. No, no, I, I was just gonna say, um, perhaps it's because I'm so ancient, um, but I think it also has something to do with tennis writing. You know, we're talking about contemporary players, Nadal, Federer, and so forth. <clears throat> One thing that bothers me about tennis writing, and reporting as well as literary writing, is the amnesia that is involved. Other sports, in fact, every sport that I can think of, depends upon a knowledge of, a familiarity with the history of the game. The Not great basketball. Figures. Pardon? Not basketball. Basketball well, has no relation with its past. Well, again, At because all. I'm older, I do remember the, the people in early NBA basketball, but maybe that's, maybe that's a point. Everything has accelerated, and the assumption is that the players who are playing now are ipso facto better than the ones who played 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years ago. Uh, I'm not altogether convinced. I'm not altogether convinced. I mean, I'm sounding like John Updike when he was talking in Rabbit Run about watching basketball on television and saying, well, if you could palm the ball and walk every time you dribbled, uh, I would have been a pro player. I mean, the game, not only the game has changed, but the officiating of the game mm. has changed. Uh, just like the, Jeff was pointing out yesterday, pole vaulting is no longer the sport that it was. It's not even the event that it was. Uh, the highest pole vaulter with a stiff pole was Warner Van Damme, who, who uh, vaulted 14 feet. Now people in high school who've just taken up the sport with flexible sticks jump higher than that. They, you have people who are no accounts who are jumping over 20 feet. It's not the same game. And I, I don't think that the game today with the equipment and with the change in equipment is the same game as people were playing 10, 15, 20, and 30 years ago. I have a feeling though that if they were all playing with wooden rackets again, there would be, uh, I'd still put my money on McEnroe um, maybe, maybe Federer is the only one who could possibly compete with him. I know that's a, uh, a retrograde uh, opinion, but I think it's important to the writing of tennis to have some sort of awareness of what came before and who did what. It, well, mm. uh, and it's, uh, you know, it's not often that you have a sort of old timers event in tennis that means anything that people think, oh my God, here they come. Uh, but I think yeah. it's, I mean, God, I, I was always determined that at some point in the course of this conversation, I would sing the praises of Wimbledon over and above the US Open. Hmm. And I think one of the many uh, traditions at Wimbledon that I really love is the way that uh, the first uh, gay match on centre court hmm. is with the defending men's championship. Hmm. And what that means is that we have an unbroken connection with mm. the past, as mm. though if the 50, we disregard the, pre, the 50 weeks mm. intervening, mm. and it just picks up again, as mm. though this thing is going on and on, mm. so you can mm -hmm. trace back mm. uh, with, uh, seamlessly to, to, mm. to, to the people. And I think that's, a, that's much more effective than those rather embarrassing moments when, and Roger's guilty of this, when he's always going on about rocket rod labor, I'm sure it was great, but then they, bring on this sort of increasing, they sort of bring this guy back from the tomb, this mm. Lazarus-like figure, and that, mm. that, he just looks like an old guy. Mm -hmm. He is an old guy. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> an um, old guy who's had a stroke. Yeah, uh, well, I'm a stroke survivor myself, so, um, but anyway, but the thing is, it just, it just doesn't seem to work, that sort of um, antique roadshow thing that they, mm. they do. <laughs> Whereas, uh, uh, I think there is a, I, I just love that, well, hold on, since we're talking about literature and tennis, 
What if we applied that to literature, which is actually beginning to happen, I think, but mm -hmm. what if we applied it to, and I, I see it all the time now, a biography comes out of a, a celebrated writer of 20 or 30 years ago, and the first line of every review is, does anybody read John Updike anymore? <laughs> yeah. Does will William yeah. Styron even get published today? Mm -hmm. uh, is uh, Gore Vidal worth a mention? Mm -hmm. uh, if in literature we feel it's important to recognize the writers who preceded us mm -hmm. and who f uh, fed the work Indeed. and who left it changed and then advanced into today, uh, and people say, well, who, who was most influential on you as a writer? And people are always saying Tolstoy and, you know. Uh, Tolstoy, who was a, a, a great tennis, tennis player, tennis player yeah. wasn't he? Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. I mean, seriously. You think you're getting yeah, yeah. squeezed out here, Louisa. No, I'm, I'm going to push back on this actually a little bit because Please. I think um, you. I think you're right that um, tennis does see itself, and I'm going to use this word kind of in a literal sense, like as progressive. That mm. the, the tennis players today, that Roger or Nadal mm. or Djokovic, but no one else is the best male tennis mm. player ever to play, and Serena is the best ever to play. I mean, and that there's no. There's sort of like no historical debate over the progression of tennis, mm -hmm. even though um, obviously the technology has changed and the form of the game has changed and all this stuff. But I actually think um, last night we had this com a little bit of a version of this conversation. I agreed with you, but I'm changing my mind. <laughs> okay. You're <laughs> because, free, to, free to do that. You know, actually, I'm going to say the exact opposite, which is that tennis reveres its legend more than any other sport. Um, that tennis is the only sport I can think of where they literally bring out old champions and they play at Wimbledon, they play at the uh -huh. US Open, and that's on ESPN. Mm -hmm. Like you can watch Martina Navratilova and Chrissy Everett play a tennis match today, you know, mm -hmm. on good. TV, it's and it's good. quite good. And, yeah. and there's actually, and we can get to this too, but like there's something about the fact that you can still play tennis even after you're no, you know, they don't do this with the NFL. They don't have, you know, yeah. <laughs> kind of old NFL stars Thank like God. putting on their pads and mm. playing a, you know, a, a kind of like old timers game. They don't have, yeah, they have yeah. baseball old timers game, but it's not the same thing. Um, and actually that among the stars, you know, there is, I think there is probably a lot of amnesia and a lot of kind of like um, unwillingness to sort of borrow from or learn from their, I don't know, predecessors. But at the same time, there's a kind of, um, almost over the top, you know, um, celebration of, of, of past experience when they, celebration is the wrong word, but there was this like very kind of like very popular trend of, of getting old legends as coaches. You know, so we had Stefan Edberg there. We have Boris Becker. We have, you know, Yvonne Lendl. And I mean, when, you know, Murray was doing well, it was all because of Yvonne Lendl. You know, I mean, it was like almost like Murray didn't even get the credit that I that he deserved because this other guy, this legend, was getting the credit, and that there was something kind of like, to me, a little bit strange about this kind of like sudden explosion of, um, I mean, it's almost like a, a fetish in a way. It was like sort of like important to have like you're the guy in the box to look to in that one critical moment to give you that one percent. You hear the commentator saying like, well, you know, Edberg's just there to get for that one point to give him that extra point one percent or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, what's going on here? Mm -hmm. um, but I do think you're right in the sense that there is a kind of um, there's a kind of assumption that things just get better and better. But I think that's also a kind of like, and maybe it's a particularly American assumption. I think that there's. You just mentioned some people. Let me ask you. Um, I don't know how old you are, but did you ever see Yvonne Lendl play? I did not. Okay. Only okay. on TV. I mean, on YouTube. I'm Pardon? On YouTube. Okay, on YouTube. Sure. Okay. I saw it sort of live on TV, TV but I always remember the, the Lendl era as being a rather grim and joyless one. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Uh, Can I bring up I mean, actually I think, one I think, I think Lendl is a grim, joyless person. Um, well, apparently he's, in real life, apparently he's got a very, very, very dry sense of humor. Well, I mean, <laughs> I think the very, very is important to add there. Um, yeah. um, but you have to remember, Lendl is a guy who grew up in a communist country, and when he first came out, he had to wear the Czech in Cyrillic alphabet, the Czech army seal on the back of his uh, duds. And more importantly, he was coached by his mother, who was a thwarted champion, who felt that Yvonne's birth ruined her life and her career. 
And so when she resumed her career after his birth or tried to, she used to bring him to the court and tie him on a leash to the net <laughs> um, post. She did, she did. He was such a, uh, under the sway of his mother, such a, an abused child that he couldn't beat her until he was 15 years old, mm. which is extraordinary. In fact, he would tank to his own mother, and this carried over in the first years of his life on the tour. He was an, he's an interesting guy mm -hmm. in his own creepy, creepy yeah, way. And, uh, uh, and Connors was somewhat of a mummy's boy too, Con wasn't Connor, he? Uh, and his grandma. And his oh, grandma, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. He was coached by his grandmother and his mother. Mm -hmm. um, Ross's agents. Um, I, you know, I, another creepy guy, but uh, <laughs> Connors, but. Uh, he was the only guy who was never naked in the locker room, I want you to know. Tennis parents are their own special Pardon? breed. Tennis, tennis parents, parents are their own special, special breed. breed. Yes, exactly. Well, you take us up, bring us up to date on tennis parents and what you think about them. I know there's going to be a whole thing on outlawing parents in, in, <laughs> in sport, but what do you think about the influence of tennis parents? Oh, horrible. I mean, I, I think that... Uh, I, I can't really understand. I mean, I have a daughter, and I'm like, you know, you know, mm -hmm. if she wanted, if she were having to be incredibly talented at tennis, I would be like, not in a million years, not over my dead body. Mm -hmm. um, great, get a college scholarship, please. <laughs> but, um, but there is something a little bit um, grim, and this is a, a generalization. There are, are I'm sure many, many lovely tennis parents, but. A lot of the ones you see, it's a, a kind of really um, uncomfortable dynamic because these people, a lot of their coaches, you know, a lot of them, um, you know, I don't really know. And again, this is like maybe a failure of imagination on my part, you know, but that's a hard thing to turn on and off. Like that's a hard dynamic to sustain. Yeah. And um, even the ones that you you trust are are healthy or are sold to you as healthy. You know, I mean, I was, a couple of years ago, I was writing about Zverev and people kept telling me about how like, you know, a reason to bet on him is how like wonderful his family is. And then, you know, they're playing in the ATP Cup, Zverev is playing the ATP Cup and his dad is coaching him and Zverev is like behaving like a, a lost boy or a brat or whatever you want to say. And his dad is like in tears. I mean, it's just like, it sounds like, I mean, this family, like how can you, do this, you know, how can you, and it's, it's uncomfortable to watch. Um, and you know, there are lots of um, examples of, um, you know, Caroline Wozniacki is someone else who was coached by her father and was criticized for not ever changing her game or bringing in an outside voice, or it was sort of seen, she made number one, but it was seen that she had sort of like outgrown her father in some ways and he was, he was holding her back. I mean, that was the idea and that she was a grown woman and she needed to bring in a, a real coach. And she resisted this and resisted this. And um, I had dinner with her and her husband now a year, last year, I guess. And the way she talked about her father was actually like quite moving and surprising to me. I mean, she was very kind of like... Um, she talked about him like a actually a normal daughter, <laughs> like you know, in a self-aware way is what I'm trying to say. But that's not the picture that you get, you know, when you see them on the court together and on coaching, she on court coaching. About him or, like a normal daughter. You mean yeah. she said he was an embarrassment? <laughs> kind of, yeah. <laughs> they talked but, in Polish, right? Yeah, and and she, I mean, and, and and it was clear that she like loves him very much, you know, but like that there's, I mean, it was sort of a, you know, not that I know, you can't see inside of anyone's relationship even from a foot away, but, um, but yeah, I mean, tennis is full of um, really sad stories about abusive parents and I don't, they, tennis as a, the various governing, the many governing bodies of tennis have taken various steps to limit the access that you know, limit the kind of abuse that can go on, but of course it must. And well, I don't know, it's, it's just weird though, because you don't have, like, I mean, there are basketball parents who coach their kids, but nobody's, well, with the exception of, I guess, Doc Rivers, no one's coaching their kids in the NBA. Like, I mean, it's just, mm -hmm. there is supposed to be a kind of like, 
Yeah. Well, well let's, I look, oh, go, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, you know, the proof is basically in the pudding. Baseball, basketball, and football, those dreaded sports. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry to even mention them in let's your presence. Um, but they're legacy sports. Now you're completely used to all-stars being the children of all-stars. Yeah. Uh, Steph Curry and then uh, Del Curry, right? Mm -hmm. There's nothing new. Anybody know of a top player whose kid plays? Bjorn Bjorg's youngest kid now is trying to make moves somewhere, but anybody else? Um, Anybody? Okay, One? but let me ask you, why do you think that's the case? Because it's an awful grind, and I also think oh. that I'd be hard-pressed to think of a professional tennis player who chose. They say they did, but I never believe them. Yeah. You know, you're, if you're not playing tennis pretty seriously by the time you're four, yeah, yeah. chances are you're not going to make it. No. I can think of an exception. That's Madison Keys, but she also plays like it. Yeah. Right? <laughs> but so it's a, it's, a, it's a game that's often yeah, foisted yeah. on you. This is also why I disagree with you, Michael, about the past, because if you're playing a sport seriously from four and five competitively, then you are adopting styles that then yeah. become dated. Okay. For instance, yeah. I am a child of McEnroe and Edberg, yeah. mm -hmm. right? Because that's who I was, yeah. my dad was like, right? right? Mm -hmm. So even though now I'm talking about this golden era, I feel like anybody of a certain age mm -hmm. who played at a certain age, they're carrying with them the tennis of the past, which is why, speaking of Federer's style, you see a number of players now who I think are almost caged in a style. They have a one-handed backhand, they play like Federer because that's, there was profit in that, yeah, but I don't know yeah. if that was necessarily the style that was natural yeah, to yeah. them. Oh, before we go further, I'd like to reel back to a point that you made about, first of all, starting at four, um, and um, uh, ask you, ask not only you, but the, the audience as well, to think about that for a minute. Um, if you've ever raised children, you know that to keep their attention for 20 seconds, much less 20 minutes, mm -hmm. much less for four hours, is extraordinary. And the, the attention or the pressure that you would have to put on them to get them to do that is extraordinary. And it would seem to me that in any other world except the toy department of life, sports world, what is happening to children in tennis would be called child abuse mm -hmm. and the children would be taken away from their, their parents. Um, a couple of years ago, I was spending the summer on Mallorca and I naturally went over to, uh, to, to Manacor to see where mm. Rafa started out and I interviewed some of the pros who had been teaching since his day and I asked what was the difference between Rafa and the other players that you coach, why did he go on to become what he became? And they said there was no difference. Uh -huh. And I said, as a child, there was no, he said there was no difference. It's just they all started at sort of the same age. It was just that he kept doing it. He mm. went on doing it mm. and he kept doing it and he was determined to go on and do it. And partly it was his stick to itness. they felt that was the crucial factor. Later on in the afternoon, my wife and I went to a club and hit and not his club, but in a different club. And while we were there on an the adjacent court, there was a kid who couldn't have been more than five years old who was hitting with the pro. He could hit with topspin off both sides. He was indefatigable. He, he was this tall. He was an extraordinary player uh, just for his form. But what was also extraordinary is he cried during the entire hour that I spent there. He was <laughs> sobbing. <laughs> And because he was small, when he ran wide for balls, he would invariably fall to his knees. Both of his knees were skinned and bleeding, but he stayed out there for an hour. And it reminded me, okay, this is the making of a champion, but it's the making of a champion in the way that bowls are made into a hamburger, which is, a, you know, in, the, in bullfighting in Spain, the way that they determine the bulls that are allowed into the ring to fight is when they're young, they ride into the fields that the matadors do with lances and run into them and knock them down. And those who turn and run away, they go right to the butcher oh, right at, at that point. The ones who attack the horse are the ones that go into, you know, go on to the bull ring. I think, um, I think the whole issue of abuse, especially on the women's tour, is a very serious one and it has to do not just with physical abuse, and I don't mean abuse in the sense that 
They're, they're making Betty Sue practice. I mean, they're knocking her around when she doesn't practice. They're slapping her. Mm -hmm. uh, you've had girls that were beaten on court at professional turn. And boys. Turn Pardon? And boys. And boys. Yeah. 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 And, and you don't it, get away. Usually sports, hey, we've got an away game, right? We're going up uh, yeah. right. away, but in tennis, no, you're yeah, traveling you're and your parents, your you're always with your dad in the car, you know? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. But this is what I kind of love about professional tennis, oh. to me at its best. <laughs> Tell me about no, it. No, 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 that you see people of a certain age trying to figure themselves out. Mm. Right. You know what I mean? Mm. Like you have people who are kind of f trying to figure out if they can get away with not looking at their box. This whole thing about, that's why this wonderful thing you said about the ball, the point, the match, and I kept thinking every time you finished the sentence, and the box, and the yeah. box, oh, and the box. Yeah. Because tennis players are always gonna look up at their box, right? Mm. Or a lot of them do. But a lot of them are in the process of just, not just even figuring out the, the, the match or their opponent, um, but themselves, you know? It, 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 I, mm. I love that. I also, I mean, you talk about Rafa. I mean, Rafa wasn't just, born, he was also made. I mean, yeah, Uncle Tony made the decision to make him left-handed. He was not born yeah, left-handed. Yeah. I am sure that Rafa was not like, hey, like, I have an idea, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> this might be better for my professional tennis career. Um, and, you know, that doesn't mean that Uncle Tony, like, is the reason that, you know, Rafa is Rafa, it, but it's not irrelevant. Um, and I think that most tennis players, you know, it's the more they're kind of extreme examples are the Richard Williamses and the, you know, um, I mean, they're Martinez kind of, mom. Mar yeah, sure. I mean, Tracy Austin, you know, whatever. Um, but at the same time, I think that um, that's a kind of uh, there. That's true in sports, though, in general. And I think that one thing that's really kind of interesting is like, how do you and something I struggle with is like, how do you basically as a non-sports fan, but as a, because one of the difficult things about a, a parent is that they're not supposed to be a sports fan, right? They're not supposed to like get mad at their kid when they lose, right? They're supposed to be un unconditionally loving, you know, that's right. So how can you be a coach? Like how can you kind of like put more stock in winning than in losing, you know? Um, and so it's like, and it's a, it's a difficult thing. I mean, my husband's a, a former professional athlete, and like I wouldn't want my child to be a professional athlete. Like I wouldn't want them to feel like they're. I don't. I don't. I wouldn't want my child to think that like losing says anything about them or matters in any way, or that competition. I mean, I find competition to be like distorting, you know, and. But as a fan, like, obviously I'm deeply invested in who wins. As a coach, I would be deeply invested in who wins. But how do you do that as a, as a parent? And, you know, I am very close to my mother-in-law. I don't think she's a bad person, you know, even though she thinks everything is a competition, you know? Like, I mean, but there's a different kind of, like, set of assumptions that you have to make, you know, when you are a, the parent of an athlete that maybe we... I don't know, I don't want to go. I'm kind of walking into territory. Um, <laughs> Stay away from. <laughs> um, I see you taking notes, Jeff. You must have another question. You have another issue. Um, no, well, it's the moment slightly past, but when we were talking about when you see how people are trying to figure things out yeah. in the midst of a game, mm -hmm. um, this year, or last year rather, I decided I wanted to watch the World Chess Championship. Uh, for the following reason. I watched it too. It's okay. It's, uh, yeah, it turns out it's actually not a great spectator sport. Mm. But um, <laughs> the, the reason that I wanted to watch it is because when I was watching the Roger Rafa Australian final, mm -hmm. and I've watched it several times, we're the great beneficiaries now of the ever-evolving technology of covering mm. tennis. And I realized what I really loved was just the amazing concentration on their faces. And then I thought, realized, oh, maybe I don't just love watching tennis. What I really like doing is watching people concentrating. Mm -hmm. But actually, it turns out I didn't like the, uh, <laughs> the, 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 the chess so much. But yeah, I mean, it's uh, now, one of, and it's again, I think, if it's, there are, you were talking about the way that you couldn't do the McPhee book again. Mm -hmm. I think, in a way, the difference between Rowan's uh, recent book uh, and yours, Mike, mm -hmm. is again this thing of, uh, of, of access that you've mm -hmm. mentioned. But also now, I mean, it's more difficult than ever to write about tennis relative to the experience you can get watching it, isn't mm -hmm. it? 
So, you know, this year in the, uh, in the, in, uh, the US Open, you know, the first time Roger went like that, oh, <clears throat> you know, they were saying, ah, oh, you know, he's got a back problem. Right. Um, it's so, uh, to use the cliched term, now the TV coverage is so immersive. Yeah. Well, blah, 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 blah. I know that the title or the subtitle of this year's um, uh, literary seminar is Between the Lines, but I think that we're ignoring, and most tennis writing, whether it's journalism or literature, ignores what happens outside of the lines. Oh. Good. And I feel that the influence of what happens outside of the lines has a determining factor in many ways that, um, that need to be explored. But, but you know, mm -hmm. something I'll talk about tomorrow, but, but I think that uh, um, <clears throat> the, the reason, I think that access to players has certainly changed since I did Short Circuit. I did Ladies of the Court 10 years later, and I didn't find it much different then. But I think the difference in when I did those books was that I didn't just go to Wimbledon, the French Open, the US Open, and so forth. I went to a lot of small tournaments in European towns or in African towns and so forth, where you lived with the players, you talked to the players, you stayed in the same hotel, you rode in the courtesy cars with the players, and they talked. And they, you had drinks with players. And a lot of what they talked about and I'll get into this more tomorrow, is the way in which tennis is fiddled and the way in which tennis doesn't consist just of winners and losers. It consists of a kind of hive of people who have to make a living, low-ranked players, small agents, tournament directors, and so forth. But you don't need to talk to the players to know that. P pardon? That's not, you don't need to talk to the players to know that. To, what do you need to do? I mean, that's... There are a hive of players in different hierarchies, and there are tournament directors and everything like that. That's not privileged no, no, information. No, I'm not talking about the hierarchy here. I'm talking about fixed matches. I'm talking about tanking. I'm talking about betting. I'm talking about matches that are fixed for television. Um, Mike uh, is a big fan of Bernard Tomic. He loves Bernard Tomic because <laughs> uh, Tomic tells it like it is. What he, what he said that year at Wimbledon was he didn't care. And I think that um, if you were to put a lie detector on most of the players and ask them the extent to what they care, they would say, except for maybe the top 15 or 20 people, they don't care. That is, they care enough that they want to keep their ranking high enough that they can get into tournaments. They live a very nice life. Uh, uh, pardon me, they live a very financially rewarding life. It's not a nice life. It's a grind, as, as Rowan was saying. But I think that um, to ignore what happens, to ignore uh, what we see on television, you were making the thing about, uh, a remark about television, um, you know, is to, to ignore, for example, the fact that for the last 10 years and so forth, Roger Federer in Australia in the sweltering summer heat there has played only two matches during the day, mm -hmm. okay? He's played 12 of his 14 matches at night. It was revealed last year that Roger has a financial investment and is involved with the director of the, um, Mr. Tilly, Chris Tilly, who's the director of the Australian Open. How can you have a financial involvement with a tournament director how can you hire that guy to promote the Laver Cup? And then you go there mm -hmm. and you find that your matches are always at night in the cooler weather. Mm -hmm. Well, I think Roger would win anyhow. He deserves yeah. favorite treatment. But I think if it were happening in any other sport, we'd all be jumping up and down and, and saying these people should be held mm -hmm. to account. Mm -hmm. God. How, how do you? Five minutes. Oh, time, is it? Is somebody five calling minutes. time? Yeah, five yeah. minutes. Do we, don't we just want to keep on going? <laughs> no. hmm. I suppose we should open it to questions if there sure. are questions. If there are no questions. And to ask your question. OK. There, there's a question. Oh, you, yes. Um, of the people that you've interviewed and done uh, stories about, 
Do any of these tennis players actually have fun? Do they really enjoy what they're doing? Because my experience in watching them is that the amount of time that they put in is just so overbearing that unless you really love it, it, it seems like torture. I, I've, I've watched, uh, when I was uh, at IMG, I was just there in a group tennis thing. I saw Maria Sharapova when she was 16 hitting balls cross court from her coach from a barrel for half an hour. She never uttered a word other than shrieking every time she hit the ball, never complained. But it looked like torture to me. Well, it beats working for a living. <laughs> Nick Curious said that to me is once I was like, well, why do you play if you don't want to, you know, if you really don't need them, you know, you don't care, you don't like it, then why, what are you doing? He goes, beats working at Chipotle. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's, um, you know, uh, one of the, th I, I had its moment of sort of fierce, uh, sort of astonishment, really, when Lionel, in her talk, was uh, talking about the way that, um, you know, she realized she put more, her, her sporting life was more disciplined than her working life. And that was sort of extraordinary to me because, you know, writing is a grim old life. And uh, one of the things I find when I play tennis, I never loved the life of the writer more than when I'm playing tennis on a Tuesday afternoon. <laughs> Uh, right. And I feel this is the literary life. This is it's, really, really great. And I think, I mean, to me, the life of the, of the, you know, low-ranked tennis player. Uh, uh, to me, some, we were talking about this last night. It seems to me, Gael Monfils has a great life. He has a load of fun. And now that he's, you know, that he's going out with Svitolina. Yeah, yeah, they just have the most idyllic life. I mean, I would change places with can, those two in, a, in an instant. I watched them practice once. I can vouch they were having a lot of fun on the tennis court yeah. together. Um, but I think that everybody has a different experience. I think that there are a lot of people who really do hate it, who do find it torture, but they need to make money and they need to, or they feel they need to make money and this is the only thing they know and, you know, it's like a lot of jobs. Like, well, what else am I going to do? Um, uh, but I also think that there are some people also for whom um, happiness is maybe a kind of ill-defined concept, right? I mean, you might be in torture in the moment. There are a lot of writers who hate writing, oh, but yeah. they love publishing, right? Yeah. So there are a lot of tennis players who might hate practicing or hate mm -hmm. being on the court at any given moment, but gosh, they love like that handshake at the end, you know, mm -hmm. or they love winning or they love yeah. some aspect of Whereas it. Whereas we writers are just, the idea of getting angry on a tennis court is so inconceivable yeah. to me now at my age because I'm just sure. so blissfully happy to still be, oh, you know, um, playing at some... Well, you were I blissfully think... happy at Wimbledon too. I remember <laughs> watching matches. You were oh, blissfully... it's, well, Wimbledon is so, so great, isn't it? I think this is something, actually, I did want to say that one of the things about tennis, as opposed to other sports, I think there's some idyllic quality to it. So I've just finished reading uh, Giorgio Bassani's um, The Garden of the Finzi Contini's, you know, where, set in Italy, and as anti-Semitism is rising, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> these characters get kicked out of their club for being Jewish, and then one of the, a rich family with a tennis, mm. their own tennis court, they take them in, and there's this sort of threatened but idyllic world there in, mm. in their garden. And it seems to me one of the wonderful things that Wimbledon has maintained is to keep that idyllic quality so that at some level, even on centre court, with that hated thing, the royal box, which of course we hate so much, I'm such a fierce Republican in the European sense, in the European sense, <laughs> I emphasize, still at the same time you can think, yeah, there's still a hint of this just being a lovely little game at the vicarage. There's also, I mean... This is a man who's drunk the Kool-Aid. <laughs> <laughs> um, I talked to Simona Halep, who is someone who has, for long stretches of her career, seemed like pretty unhappy, you know, at times on the tennis court, very down on herself. <laughs> miserable, um, but, you know, would insist on some fundamental lo level that she loves the game and in the past couple of years has really embraced this project of um, trying to be happier as a person and as a player and connecting, trying to do that through tennis, yeah. you know, and there was something incredibly moving about um, listening to her speak because I think a lot of us are engaged in a similar project, you know, which is like, how do we, how do we want to be? 
you know, and, and tennis is no different in some ways than any other thing. It's just done in front of millions of people and mm -hmm. in with more money on the line. And, um, you know, that there is a way in which you, you, everybody approaches it differently, but there is an opportunity in it to sort of, yeah, I don't know, not only express yourself, but also kind of like, yeah, as Rowan put it earlier, like, try and, and figure yourself out in the middle of these points. And I don't know, I mean, that's one of the reasons I, um, you know, I, I keep coming back to tennis, even though it, there are a lot of problems with it, as Mike will tell you. There was another question out here, I remember, yes. There were, in fact, there are several. Yeah, we don't, that's it, we don't have time. Have we, have we, yeah, we cut them all? Yeah. 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 Yeah.